This Sunday on Capital Connection, President Trump lets Rod Blagojevich go free. A tremendously powerful, ridiculous sentence in my opinion. How the disgraced former governor attempted to rewrite history and gloss over the ways he corrupted the highest office in the land of Lincoln. I committed no crimes. Congressman Darren LaHood joins us with reaction after his pleas to President Trump fell on deaf ears. Plus, this budget represents a bridge to the future. Governor Pritzker rolls out his second budget address with threats to roll back the education funding formula if voters don't approve his progressive income tax. It inevitably cuts into some of the things that we all hold most dear. Increased funding for K-12 education, universities and community colleges. Holding education and health care hostage uh, in order for him to be able to fulfill a campaign promise I think is inappropriate. And House Democrat Chris Welch joins us as he pushes for college athletes to get paid. It's all coming up on Capital Connection. From the Illinois State Capitol Rotunda. Capitol Bureau Chief Mark Maxwell is asking the tough questions. This is Capitol Connection. Welcome to Capitol Connection. I'm Mark Maxwell reporting from the Illinois State House on this Sunday, February 23rd. Rob Lagojevich is a free man. On Tuesday this week, President Trump snapped his fingers, summoned his executive authority, and effectively unlocked the jail cell that held Rob Lagojevich in that Colorado prison for eight years. Not quite the 14-year prison sentence he was handed down after being convicted by a jury of his peers on 18 counts of corruption. But that did not stop the former governor from coming home and trying to seize the rock star mantle he had worked so hard to build up for so many years. His fortune has silvered my hair. In his first remarks as a free man, disgraced former Illinois Governor Rod Lagojevich described his prison sentence as something bad that happened to him rather than a consequence of something bad he did to the people of Illinois from the state's highest office. What they did was corrupt. I committed no crimes. These were political things. And they lied and cheated. The hubris of the former governor's defiant denials sounded nearly identical to what he told news cameras years ago. I am not guilty of any He hasn't learned anything since he got out. It's still more theater for him, and it's all about him. And uh, he's continuing to play the victim. And uh, I think that his uh, status as a felon should be recognized. And I think he needs to spend a lot of time with his family and get his life back together. As Dr. Martin Luther King used to say, truth crushed to earth will one day rise again because no lie can live forever. I'm returning home today from a long exile, a freed political prisoner. I want to say again to the people of Illinois who twice elected me governor, I didn't let you down. I would have let you down if I gave into this. But resistance to tyrants is, is obedience to God. Is it opposite day? I mean, that only makes sense on opposite day. It is a fact, it is indisputable that Governor Blagojevich failed the people of Illinois. He absolutely let them down, and he continues to let them down every minute that he refuses to acknowledge any wrongdoing. From beginning to end, this was persecution masquerading as prosecution. It was a prosecution by the same people, Comey, Fitzpatrick, the same group. I saw that, and I did commute his sentence. It was a tremendously powerful ridiculous sentence in my opinion. The federal courts did the right thing, not only at the district court level, but through the appellate court and also the U.S. Supreme Court. And I said his sentence was appropriate. Why should he get special treatment than some other people that have been sitting in the Department of Corrections for drug offenses for, you know, are getting 30, 40 year drug sentences, but they're never going to see the light of day or any type of uh, relief from this president. It's just because of the celebrity of Rob Blagojevich. I got into politics to help people. I didn't get into politics to make money. I didn't get into politics to rich my family or my friends. He was convicted of very, very serious crimes um, in trying to monetize uh, the position that he held. I saw a governor who uh, was rogue on steroids. He was a person that was not, didn't care about the state of Illinois. He cared about his own ambition. It is a broken criminal justice system, and it has been for a long time. And it's a racist criminal justice system. But there's hope. And one of the great ironies of history is that so far up till now, in the history of our country, no one has done more or is currently working to do more to fix this broken and racist criminal justice system than President Trump and Jared Kushner. That's right. President Trump is probably the least credible person to make this decision, given what he's done over and over again to thumb his nose at 
one of the core principles of our democracy is that the, no one is above the law. It would be a lot easier to stomach if the former governor had shown any contrition at any point along the way. Um, but I think Donald Trump models a, a, a behavior where you never apologize or show contrition for anything, and it seems he's rewarding people who behave the way he behaves. Joining us next, the man who tried to convince President Trump to keep Rob Lagojevich behind bars, Congressman Darren LaHood. You're watching Capital Connection from the Illinois State Capitol. We uh, want to express our most profound and everlasting gratitude to President Trump. How do you properly thank someone who's given you back the freedom that was stolen from you? Uh, he didn't have to do this. He's a Republican president. I was a Democratic governor. Trump and doing this does nothing to help his politics. I'm a Trumpocrat. The Trumpocrat, that's right. <laughs> if I have the ability to vote, I'm going to vote for him. Hey, joining us now is Republican Congressman Darren LaHood, who tried and ultimately uh, did not succeed in, in persuading President Trump to keep former Governor Blagojevich locked up behind bars. Before we get into that conversation with the president, what did you make of the, the press conference, the homecoming press conference, and the remarks of former Governor Blagojevich comparing himself to a political prisoner? Well, I thought it was ridiculous. Uh, I thought the president made a mistake in commuting the sentence of Rod Blagojevich. Uh, when you think about in the state of Illinois, um, you know, four of our last nine governors have gone to federal prison. Uh, not one has ever been pardoned or had their sentence commuted. Uh, you think about what Rod Bogoyevich did. He essentially ran the state like a cr criminal enterprise. I think there is um, no one that is less deserving of a, uh, of a commuted sentence than Rod Bogoyevich. So, uh, I, and then we saw it yesterday, uh, someone that has never expressed remorse, never apologized, never said what he did was wrong on being convicted on 18 counts of bribery, extortion, fraud, lying to the FBI. I mean, these are egregious crimes. And the other thing I would just say is, um, never once has there been an allegation there was misconduct on behalf of prosecutors, law enforcement, or the judiciary. This was taken all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and at every appeal, they said Rod Bogoyevich was wrong. There was no appealable issue. Uh, he did these crimes, and he should be held accountable. So uh, for all of that, I, I think this was a mistake. And as a former federal prosecutor, uh, I've looked at the evidence in this case, followed the case, and uh, uh, he received the low end of the federal sentencing guidelines. People think this it was could have a, been 15 to, and up. Yeah, the rec he could have gotten 30 years under the sentencing guidelines, and he got the low end by Judge Zagel. So there, uh, when I hear Rod Bogoyevich talk yesterday, I think he's in an alternative universe. Um, and, you know, a Democrat told me one time, uh, he, he, uh, Rod Bogoyevich is there, Richard Nixon. Uh, in some ways, that's what I think of. Uh, and, and I think it was a mistake for the president to, to issue the, the commutation. There's actually an old photograph of a young Rod Bogoyevich getting an autograph from President Nixon. Uh, that was somebody he admired and looked up to. It's sort of an interesting uh, changing reality. Now he says he's a Trumpocrat. He supports President Trump, says he has a kind heart. I want to get into that in a minute, but I want to single in on what you just said there. Was the totality of his crimes enough to keep him locked up for 14 years? Or what, how do you include the, the, the lack of contrition in sort of your calculus there of, of the degree to which he deserved to stay? Because some people have said, uh, some reasonable you know, judicial minds have said 14 years was a steep sentence. The crimes alone, as uh, they were passed down, the sentence and all that, was, was that enough to keep him there for 14 years? Well, listen, I think, uh, again, uh, you look at the substance of what here you look at the merits of what occurred here when you listen to those wiretaps of him shaking down the ceo of lori children's hospital for fifty thousand dollars i mean this campaign is campaign cash exactly right. yeah for campaign cash this is pay for play politics at its worst um, in a state that has a huge public corruption uh, uh, problem you and look at withholding state aid in that call. Exactly. You're not going to get state aid for your hospital unless you give me $50,000 for campaign cash. Look at what he did with the racetrack owner, or what he did with the Hollywood executive. I mean, this is exactly what we uh, are against here in the state of Illinois. You know, the president talks about draining the swamp. Rod Bogoyevich is the epitome of the swamp. And so when you look at the egregious nature of what he engaged in, uh, the, the, the pay for play politics, put aside the selling of the Senate seat, um, him using his position to gain advantage is what is wrong with this system. And so uh, Judge Zagel looked at the totality of those circumstances, and then he looked at, is this someone that is remorseful? Mm -hmm. Somebody that uh, admits what they did are, is wrong? 
No, not, not, not ever. And so um, I think he got the appropriate sentence. And clearly, when I hear him talk today, he hasn't learned from his mistakes. He doesn't think he did anything wrong. And I think that's just appalling for our state. I understand impeachment has been litigated uh, as it relates to President Trump, but from a matter of ethics and corruption and, and trust in government, compare those two instances for me. The shaking down of a children's hospital, saying I'm going to withhold state aid unless you help my campaign for re-election. I want to point something out. That campaign donation was never actually made, and the state aid was never actually withheld. In the case of the Ukraine call, President Trump saying, I want something that would effectively help my campaign, an in-kind contribution in investigating Joe Biden, withholding military aid in a state of Ukraine that is currently in a state of war against Russia. What's the difference? The aid was never withheld or, or only delayed. It was ultimately delivered. The campaign contribution or the investigation was never delivered. Comptroller Susana Mendoza, a Democrat here, has said there's a lot of symmetry between those two acts. She thinks they're both illegal acts. Uh, how do you judge President Trump's actions there as it relates to what Rob Blagojevich did with that children's hospital? Well, from a criminal standpoint, I think they're apples and oranges. There, there was no uh, dollar amount tied to what you, the, the instance you gave with the President of the United States whatsoever. And I would just say this, you mentioned that Rod Blagojevich never received any dollars on this, but it's kind of like say, when the police officer pulls you over and says, I'm going to give you a ticket unless you give me uh, you know, uh, Attempted extortion is a crime. Exactly, and that's clearly what he did here. You don't have to have the, uh, the crime to fu be fulfilled there to have that happen, and that's exactly what happened. And that's wrong, particularly when you're the governor of the state, the highest elected officer in the state. But that was repeated uh, throughout uh, this investigative process, and that was put forth to a jury. O on, the, on the presidential side of things, um, listen, impeachment is a political process. It's not a criminal. There was no criminal violations uh, that were that were brought forth by the Justice Department. There were no elements that were satisfied. Because they can't. The Justice Department said we cannot bring a charge against a sitting president. That's what impeachment exists for. But but if you go back to the Clinton uh, impeachment, a lying under oath is a criminal violation. Correct. He violated those criminal elements. He was impeached for lying under oath. Same Take, thing. Taking a campaign contribution from a foreign government is a felony as well. That's, that's well, that a wasn't a campaign contribution here uh, in this particular case. I would also say this. Um, at the federal level, when I think about impeachment, it's, it's kind of the nuclear option, Mark. It's the last resort. It's right. the death penalty. Clearly, the Senate um, analyzed that. And many of them thought what he did was wrong, inappropriate, maybe unconventional, but it wasn't impeachable offense. This wasn't something that was so treasonous or a violation of criminal statute to cause that to happen. So I think these are really apples and oranges. Well, the, 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 I think the punishment is also apples and oranges. Impeachment means you just have to leave office. Rob Blagojevich was put in a jail cell for, for uh, eight years, nine years, uh, I guess eight years actually. Um, but you, you mentioned that Rob Blagojevich, it's clear to you that he did not learn from his mistakes. President Trump to this day still says he did nothing wrong on that call. It was a quote, perfect call in his view. Did President Trump learn from the House impeachment, was there, was there some lesson for him to learn? Should he engage in that behavior again? Well, listen, I think it was a blatant political process that when going after the president. You had people... But should he do that call again? Were you okay with that call? Listen, if he was asking my advice on that, I wouldn't recommend him doing that call. I don't think that's appropriate language to engage in with a foreign leader. But do you think he's learned his lesson? Do you think he's received the message? Listen, I, I think the, the yes, I do think the president will not be engaged in any more calls like that. Very interesting. Uh, the president has also been engaged in, in a lot of other policy moves uh, on trade, uh, on, on the economy, and he's really sort of uh, flexing his muscle, going back to the, to the campaign trail, trying to get reelected again. Uh, how would you pitch Donald Trump? I believe you're still a, a delegate for his reelection in Illinois. How would you pitch his reelection to the voters in Illinois in 2020? Well, listen, I'm, a prou I'm actually the co-chair of his uh, reelection here in Illinois, and I'm a proud co-chair. I didn't agree with him on the Bogoyevich issue, but um, you look at the results that we've had in this country. Anybody that goes into the voting booth in November and asks, are they better off than they were four years ago, I think the answer of 90% of the people is yes. You look at the economy, lowest unemployment we've had in 50 years. There's more people working in this country than ever before. We've moved 8 million people off food stamps. Consumer confidence at an all-time high. Um, the average middle-class family has between four and $5,000 more in their bank account. What does that mean? That means more money for that means for, for, for putting uh, gas in the gas tank, going on a vacation, buying a washer and dryer, getting a new backpack for your kid. Um, it's real results. And that's been done with tax reform, mm -hmm. a regulatory environment that lets the private sector flourish. So that's been strong. You look at uh, trade, for instance. Our four largest trading partners in Illinois, Mexico, Canada, China, Japan, 
We now have trade agreements with all four of them, done under this president in a bipartisan way. I proudly supported all those. So whether it's our farmers, our manufacturers, our small businesses that trade, uh, that, that is a good thing for the long-term viability of this country. And lastly, on national security, mm -hmm. um, it took a, a lot of leadership to take out Soleimani, uh, the, the Shia Iranian terrorist. You supported that? Absolutely. And taking out al-Baghdadi, the Sunni. Uh, terrorist, right? Both of those were done by this president. They were bold moves, but they've made America safer. Uh, eliminating ISIS has made America safer. So this is a president that's not afraid uh, to take those actions to help protect this country. And so whether it's national security, whether it's trade, whether it's the economy, this president has real results. All right, Congressman Darren LaHood, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Mark. We're back in just a moment with House Democrat Chris Welch, who's pushing to help student athletes get paid. He also weighs in on former Governor Rob Lugovich getting to go home. You're watching Capital Connection from the Illinois State Capitol. Joining us now is House Democrat Chris Welch. It's good to have you with us. Oh, thank you for having me. I want to get your reaction first to the biggest news of the week here with former Governor Blagojevich. Uh, he compared himself in his sort of uh, homecoming tour uh, to, he compared his court case to that of Dred Scott. He quoted Martin Luther King. He called himself a political prisoner whose freedom was, quote, stolen from him and compared himself to immigrants who fled oppression under a Nazi regime. Is this man seeing clearly? Well, he clearly hasn't changed. Uh, I mean, he, he's Blagojevich. Uh, that's how he was before he went in, and that's how he is now. Uh, and I, I would say if there's anything to sum up the week, it's unfortunate to see that there's no contrition, uh, that he didn't learn anything. Uh, you would think that uh, after getting out, whether you agree or disagree with what President Trump did, that he would be remorseful. Uh, and I'm, I'm sad to see that he's not remorseful. It's interesting to see. And I think a lot of uh, reasonable people have said 14 years comparatively to other similar crimes like George Ryan, uh, it just didn't quite match up. But you, you do have that contrition angle as well. Um, if we re rewind the clock back to when Governor Blagojevich was very popular and in Chicago, he did have a wide swath of support from the black voter base. And, and how do you explain that? How was he able to tap into that kind of support uh, back then? Well, Rob Bogoyevich is extremely popular still to this day in the black community. He's like a rock star in districts like mine. Uh, and that's because he did things that uh, appealed to black voters. Uh, you know, he provided health care for kids. He provided things for seniors, like free rides. Uh, he appealed to the most vulnerable. Uh, and uh, in many aspects, those are folks in the black community. Uh, and so, uh, he, he was then, and he is now, still a very popular person uh, in African American circles. And yet, we heard those FBI wiretap tapes where he would discuss the black voter base as something to be taken uh, granted. Uh, he would take it for granted, or he would discuss it in sort of a unvarnished political calculation terms. Even with uh, now Governor Pritzker, those many years ago, when they were talking about how to uh, maybe we should put Jesse White in President Obama's Senate seat. Or uh, when you hear a politician like that discuss it the black voter base in those terms and sort of take them for granted, that can't sit well. You know, it, it shouldn't sit well. Uh, and if, if you really pay attention, I, I heard Blagojevich describe himself this week as a, a Trumpocrat. Those two guys are extremely similar. He was actually Donald Trump in politics before we ever realized Donald Trump will become a politician. In, in what way? Uh, he loves to play to the TV. Uh, he loves being in the media and talking things up. And unfortunately, a lot of times people, that's all they see is they see the celebrity side and they don't really uh, delve any deeper uh, and, and see uh, what their true beliefs are. Those tapes were played everywhere. But the reality is, is a lot of people probably still to this day never heard them. Well, there was other big news this week. Governor Pritzker gave his second annual budget address. There were sort of two budgets in here. One, if he gets his progressive income tax. One, if he does not. That's right. Let's focus on that second part, the one where if voters reject it, like they've done three times now in Colorado, the most recent state to put that question to the voters. If voters in Illinois do what they did in Colorado and say, nope, we're not quite ready for the progressive income tax just yet, Governor Pritzker has said, well, there goes the education funding formula. We're not going to give it that full $350 million increase. We're going to shave that about in half, reducing it by $150 million. Is that fair? to kids in underfunded school districts? Well, I, I, I think all of us have to be concerned about the uh, equity-based uh, school funding formula that we work so hard to put in place. Uh, however, the governor uh, is in a unique position. 
uh, you know, pension obligations continue to rise and other pressures on the budget continue to rise. Uh, and so he had to uh, come in yesterday uh, or this week and present uh, uh, various scenarios. Uh, and he basically was giving us, here's what I would hope for, uh, but if my hopes don't pan out, here's what's really going to happen. Uh, and I think we, he had to do that. Uh, you've got a very interesting push. It's gotten some national headlines even to uh, push like they've done in California, here in Illinois, to allow college athletes to be paid. I, I want to break that down a little bit because I think you've got a few different ways they can do that through endorsements, through merchandise sales, through the university directly even. Uh, how, how is it or why? It, let, let's start with the how and we'll get to the why in a minute. But how is it that you think college athletes should be paid? What's the best way to, to do that in a, in a fair way? So the bill I have pending is not a pay to play uh, uh, bill. Uh, that's a different issue and I think it would uh, take a lot more work uh, and uh, significant push Paying to get it done. Paying them like you pay the pros. Correct. You, you know, it wouldn't, schools wouldn't be required to pay any type of salary or anything. What we're saying here is, is that colleges, universities, coaches, all of these folks are making millions and billions of dollars off of the name, likeness, and image of an athlete. So why shouldn't the athlete be able to also benefit from their own name, likeness, and image? They should be able to go out and sign endorsement deals. They should be able to go out and promote local businesses in these college towns. Nowadays with social media, all of them have social media accounts. They should be allowed to get paid to promote things on their social media. Uh, if they do it now, they will lose their eligibility to play in, under NCAA rules. And that's why there's this national movement all across the country, state by state. Uh, people are putting pressure on the NCAA uh, and Illinois should, should, should join that fight. And that's why I've been pushing really hard. All right, fascinating discussion with House Democrat Chris Welch. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. We're back in a moment. Thank you.